happy evening, a very good evening. I hope and I believe all of you are doing well. And finally, we are done and dusted with NEET PG 2021, the most awaited exam. And I am sure all of you now have a sigh of relief. Uh, before we start with the session, a quick note whether the audio visual is all good. Give me a minute. I think it should be a bit better now, guys. Uh, I think it should be. Is it better now guys? I'm sorry for that audio issue. That's the reason it got late. Uh, got some issues with the laptop. Yeah. All right. So everyone here, I hope you have uh, uh, you have done well with your NEET PG 2021. If not, remember that this is not the last exam that you have to get into your PG residency. There are other exams coming. And, uh, you know, as days will pass, there will be one question coming in your mind every day that uh, you will realize, you know, you thought this was the answer. You were pretty sure that this was the answer. But then when the recall sessions were happening, discussions were happening, and you get to know that that was not the answer. So it is going to happen for sure. So please remember that you are not the only one who has made mistakes. Everyone has made mistakes. So it happens. Whatever questions we think are right, they are not actually right all the time. So do not worry on that front. And I would say that be happy that everyone else has also made the mistakes. That is what will give you a bit of peace of mind. Okay. So uh, today uh, we are going to discuss the radiology uh, questions. Uh, we are going to discuss that appeared in NEET PG 2021. There were quite a few questions, like a approximately 15 to 20 directly or in an integrated fashion. And for if I have students here uh, who are uh, appearing for NEET PG 2022, so we have recently started with the new batch on 8th of September. Uh, please make the best of it. And also the FMG students, these are the batches that you should be looking for. Now, starting with our questions, this was the question that you had. A patient presents with abdominal pain, distension, the dilated bowel loops which are shown in the radiograph are which bowel loops? Is it jejunum, is it duodenum, is it ileum or is it transverse colon? So I think this was an easy question that is there. And uh, now since we see here that these dilated bowel loops, the uh, air-filled bowel loops here, they have volvule conniventus. They have complete rings which we see traversing the entire abdomen. And that is what it looks like your feathery appearance that we call on the barium studies because of this volvule conniventus. That is why this is jejunum, right? This is jejunum. Ilium, we know that it is featureless or it is characterless. It is the smooth bowel loop. And transverse colon, majority might have get, got have confused between jejunum and transverse colon. The colon has hostrations which are incomplete projections. While your jejunum has 
complete rings. That is how we differentiate jejunum for transverse colon. So the answer here is jejunum. Okay, the answer here is jejunum. That is what we need to remember. Next one, a 10-year-old child presents with limb pain. The bone mineral density appears normal. What is the diagnosis? Is it scurvy? Is it rickets? Is it pycnodysostosis? Or is it metaphyseal dysplasia? So you were also given some arrows here, right? You were given some arrows here. You were given some arrows here to identify. So very, very important scurvy versus rickets. We have discussed this time and again. The features of scurvy, basically scurvy has the white line of frankel, right? It has that white line of frankel, which is the dense zone of provisional calcification. Adjacent to that, in scurvy, you would see the leucine zone, which is the tremor filled zone or the scorbutic zone. Then we have the cortex of the bone, which is pencil thin cortex. There can be subperiosteal hemorrhages, which is the cause of severe pain in the limbs and it leads to pseudo paralysis. Then again, we have the epiphysis, which looks like a ring that is pencil cortex and the osteoid is not very clearly seen. That is the Wimberger's ring or the ring epiphysis. Then we have this projection like things at the metaphysis which are called the pelican spur, right, which are called the pelican spur. Now look at this image again, this image which you see, there is this white line of frankel adjacent to that the black line which is the tremor field zone and there is this ring epiphysis and that is what was shown in the image as well. You have the pelican spur here, right, you can see this spur like thing, there is this pelican spur, there is this white line of frankel and we have the epiphysis which looks like a ring, okay, which looks like a ring. So the answer here is scurvy. Now, in rickets, the problem is basically with your vitamin D deficiency. So calcium is not there. And that is why the bone mineral density will be affected. When it is given that the bone mineral density is normal, so rickets is out. Pycnodysostosis is out. Why? Because pycnodysostosis causes, it is one of the differentials of diffuse osteosclerosis. There is increased bone density and we have vermian bones. Okay, and we have vermian bones. Now, what are the findings that we see in this image? What do you think? If now, next time, now remember that in the subsequent years, it is the questions with a bit twist which are repeated. We saw quite a few questions which were repeats in this year's exam as well. Like we will see ahead, what do you think is the diagnosis here? What do you think is the diagnosis here? Now, next time you get this image, what are we seeing here? Here we are seeing that there is the bowing of the femur bones, right? There's the bowing of the femur bones. The metaphysis do not look very clear. There is some splaying that we see. There is cupping and there is fraying. The borders are not very clear, okay? So, in that case, the diagnosis here becomes rickets. So, I hope the difference is clear. Rickets, the bones are weak. Weight bearing leads to bowing, it leads to splaying of the metaphysis, it leads to cupping of the metaphysis, and there is fraying. You will not see the white line of frankel in active rickets because for white line we need calcium. In rickets, there's a problem with calcium. So, when do we see the white line of frankel in rickets? When you've given patient, uh, patient treatment and the patient is responding to treatment. So, white line of frankel is seen in healing rickets while white line of frankel is seen in active scurvy that is an important difference between the two okay uh no today here we are discussing only radiology i have discussed many other questions of other subjects as well you know just what questions appeared in the exam in the today's free life class we had at 5 pm there we have discussed the other subjects as well okay Going to the next question, a 30-year-old female presents with sterile pyuria. Radiograph is shown. What is the diagnosis? Now, this is a very, very important clue here. Anyone remembers the fourth option here? One was nephrocalcinosis, putty kidney, staghorn calculus. What was the fourth option there? Anyone could help me in recalling that?
Yes, so sterile pyuria is a very, very important feature of TB, the renal TB, the urinary tract TB. It is sterile pyuria because those bacilli are not grown very easily. Now, what do we see here is this was an image, very, very similar image, which was seen in the, okay, the other one was psoas abscess or psoas calcification. All right. Thank you so much for that recall, for helping me in that recall. All right. So, what do we see here? The entire kidney here is calcified like cement, white like cement. And if you notice here, even the ureter, this tube-like thing coming from the kidney, even that is showing calcification. So, there is ureteric calcification and there is entire renal calcification as well. So, the kidney becomes non-functioning and that is what it leads to autonephrectomy, right? It leads to autonephrectomy. TB can lead to papillary necrosis, clubbing of colitis, moth-eaten colitis and then putty kidney calcification, autonephrectomy. What appearance of the urinary bladder do we get with tuberculosis? What appearance of the bladder we get because of the TB, there is fibrosis, contracted urinary bladder. So, very, very small sized urinary bladder that is called as thimble bladder. Okay, that is called as thimble bladder. So, remember TB causes thimble bladder. Okay, TB causes thimble bladder. Very important. Now, uh, so the answer here is putty kidney, which is basically TB autonephrectomy. Let us see the other ones, nephrocalcinosis and staghorn calculus. Look at this one, the same image where you have the, uh, where you have the putty kidney. What do you think is the diagnosis here? Next time, the image changes to this image. Let's say that in the subsequent year, the image changes to this one. What do you think would be the diagnosis in that case? So, look at the pattern of calcification. White is calcification here, right? White is calcification here. Absolutely right. So that's your yes, Rohit, the YY that is. You can see the calcification is following the colysis. It is following the colysis. Look at the CT scan as well. This is the calcification, the calcified stone following the pelvis and the colysis. Then in that case, it becomes the staghorn calculus, right? It is staghorn calculus, proteus infection. We know the triple phosphate stone, staghorn, right? All those is what you will see. Look at this one, the image A. First, tell me what modality is this? What investigation is this? Is it x-ray? Is it CT? Is it MRI? What do you think is this? Or do you think this is something else? Okay. So, remember guys that this is not MRI. I can see majority of you saying this is MRI. This is not MRI. So, that is where generally we, you know, make a mistake. Look always at the bone cortex. Please do not look at the bone ka marrow, the medullary cavity. Look at the bone cortex. Look at this bone cortex. The bone cortex is white. Okay, the bone cortex is white. The bone cortex is white. So, this is CT scan, which is basically a other window that we are seeing here and that is why this is a CT and look at the pattern of calcification in this image you can see that the pattern of calcification here like your you know the appearance which we say in IVP the paint brush appearance this is nephrocalcinosis okay the inner part is paired the outer part of the kidney shows the calcification this is nephrocalcinosis why in the putty kidney you will see that lobulated pattern the entire kidney will get calcified that is putty kidney this is like this image here okay compare with this image look at this lobulated calcification the entire kidney is calcified this is putty kidney and this one is nephrocalcinosis right so what appearance did we see in medullary sponge kidney which shows nephrocalcinosis medullary sponge kidney is one of the differentials of nephrocalcinosis what is the ivp appearance Medullary sponge, right? Remember the dilated collecting ducts that gives the paintbrush appearance, right? That gives the paintbrush appearance or the bouquet of flowers appearance, right? The paintbrush or the bouquet of flowers appearance. 
All right, let's go to the next one. The next question, a child undergoes prophylactic irradiation as a preparation for bone marrow transplant for the treatment of ALL. Which of the following cells will be least affected by this radiation therapy? So basically, the question is asking which of these is radio resistant? And for that, tell me what law do we have? What is that law that we have for radio sensitivity, radio resistance? We have something called as law of Bergoni, which tells that the more actively dividing the cells are, the more radio sensitive they are. Like bone marrow, there is continuous hematopoiesis, the cell division happening, it is radio sensitive. Intestinal mucosa, division happening, radio sensitive, right? Spermatogonia dividing, radio sensitive. Neurons are the ones which do not regenerate. They are not actively dividing. So, if you knew this principle, the law of Bergoni, we have discussed in our radiotherapy classes, then we know that neurons are radio resistant. Bone marrow is the most radio sensitive tissue, right? Bone marrow is the most radio sensitive tissue. Gonads are the most radio sensitive organs. And even in blood, if I ask you, which are the most radio sensitive cells? Which blood cells, peripheral blood cells are most radio sensitive? That is not RBCs, not platelets. It is lymphocytes, right? Lymphocytes are most radio sensitive and platelets are most radio resistant, right? Platelets are most radio resistant. So, remember the actively dividing cells, they are more radio sensitive. Which are the most radio sensitive? That is your category A tumors. You have category of tumors based on radio sensitivity. The most radio sensitive, the mnemonic to remember is wells, right? Wells like wills. So w for wills tumor, E for Ewing's, L for lymphoma. Remember, M is not melanoma. M melanoma is highly radio resistant. This is multiple myeloma, right? You had a question on multiple myeloma today. Patient with bone pain diagnosed with multiple myeloma. What is the prognostic factor that you will look for? It is beta 2 microglobulin. Okay, it is beta 2 microglobulin. And S for seminoma. That these are the tumors which are highly radio sensitive. Okay, these are the tumors which are highly radio sensitive. Going to the next question here. All right. A child presents with cyanosis. We discussed this just yesterday when we had radiology rapid last minute revision. What is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? So classically, we see this here, the figure of eight appearance or the snowman heart or it is also called cottage loaf heart. So if you were in a hurry and you did not read the options carefully, you might make a mistake of marking option A as the right answer. Cottage loaf. What is a cottage loaf? Let me show you the cottage loaf. This is how a cottage loaf looks like. So even that is a piece of bread which has this figure of eight kind of appearance. So figure of eight is also called as snowman heart or it is also called as cottage loaf heart. Okay. Now this is seen in supracardiac TAPVC. What do we mean by TAPVC is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Normal pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium. Instead of the left atrium, how many pulmonary veins do we have? Four pulmonary veins. They do not go to the left atrium, but they go somewhere else. Above the heart, like into the superior vena cava. In the heart, the cardiac type, that is coronary sinus or infracardiac, it might go into IVC. So, when it goes supracardiac, so what happens is all the four, okay, so these are the pulmonary veins that we are seeing. They form a common abnormal channel which drains into the brachiocephalic vein. It goes via this brachiocephalic vein into the SVC. And that is why you can see that this is the normal heart and this upper part is the abnormal channel which is draining into the SVC and that gives the figure of 8 or the snowman heart. So, this one which you see here is the abnormal channel. So, this is supracardiac TAPVC which is also called as 
type 1 TAPVC. Okay, this is also called as type 1 TAPVC. All right. So that is a snowman heart, which is supracardiac TAPVC. Egg on side TGA, that is correct, but this is not egg on side. The egg on side will be like this. Boot shape heart will have the apex going up. It is seen in tetralogy of fallow. It will have the apex going up. Okay. Next question, what is the next question here? So, I do not have the complete question, but there was this one question, a patient of RTA, there is, uh, you know, tenderness in the left lower chest wall, left hypochondrium, there is absent air entry on the left side and the patient was not stable. Patient had hypotension and all of those. What is the next step in EMR? Which of the following investigations will you do? The answer to this is snowman heart, supracardiac TAPVC. Okay, so the fourth option was, uh, the fourth option was DPL, is it? Right. So, this was, uh, so when you have a patient, any patient of road traffic accident, the first thing to be done is a fast ultrasound, right? It is fast. What do we look for? Now we are suspecting pneumothorax here. I think, no, it's not subcutaneous emphysema, etc. Fast karte hai in pneumothorax. What do we get in pneumothorax? We have discussed this again. It shows your barcode sign, the M mode of ultrasound, barcode sign or the stratosphere sign. Because what happens is, in the pleural space, there is all air. So, when you are doing ultrasound, air will not allow the sound to penetrate. So, you will not be able to see the lower lung cup movement. The lung sliding, the lung movement will not be seen. That is why the granularity, the sandy beach, the seashore sign that we see in the normal lung will be lost. So, what will we see is? all the flat lines that means no movement so that is barcode sign of stratosphere sign normal is the seashore sign because we see the granular appearance okay so barcode of stratosphere most specific sign for pneumothorax on ultrasound is the presence of lung point sign not the absence what is the lung point sign in the same image on one side you see the granular appearance on the other side, you see the barcode sign. So, that is the lung point sign, which tells you that there is definite pneumothorax which is present. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's go to the next one. So, there was some history here and you had clinical image and radiological image as well. So, there is a swelling in the wrist which is there. Radiograph is shown. What is the diagnosis? Is it GCT? Is it osteochondroma? Is it osteoid osteoma? Or is it Ewing sarcoma? First of all, I think this was somewhere around 30 year old male. Right? Ewing's is generally in a child. So, Ewing's is out by the clinical thing as well. Also, Ewing's involves the diaphysis. Here you see that lesion is reaching, it is involving the epiphysis going till the joint line. The tumor which goes till the joint line, the articular surface in a 30 year old patient, it is GCT. Be thankful that you did not have confusing options like aneurysmal bone cyst or is it chondroblastoma. These are the ones where we generally tend to get confused. That is GCT versus ABC versus chondroblastoma. Out of these, which are the ones which involve the epiphysis? It is GCT and chondroblastoma. Which is the one which occurs in immature rather than let's say which occurs in the mature skeleton? Giant cell tumor occurs after the patient becomes mature. Okay, so mature hone ke baad, giant hone ke baad, that is it occurs in mature. This is an immature skeleton. Okay, so remember these very, very important points. Okay. So, uh, let me show you the image here. This is a fused skeleton and you see it is involving the epiphysis. So, it is GCT. Look at this image. First of all, identify whether this is CT or this is MRI. What do you think? Is this CT or is this MRI? Okay. 
very good so this is a ct scan because you see that the bone cortex is white right now you know this is ct scan what is this lesion here what lesion is this do you think this is gct this is chondroblastoma or this is abc what is this Very correct. This is chondroblastoma now. Okay. Why this is chondroblastoma? Because it is immature skeleton, unfused skeleton. You can see this is not fused. And you can see that it's involving the epiphysis. So immature skeleton. Remember blastoma. Immature. That is how you can remember. And involving the epiphysis is your chondroblastoma. Okay. This is chondroblastoma. All right. Now let's go to the next image what do you think is the diagnosis here next time the image changes and you get this image in the exam what do you think is the diagnosis here Is it osteoidostoma? No, this is not. This is exostosis. You can see that it is an outgrowth from the bone. You can see that it is outgrowth from the bone, continuous with the bone cortex, going away from the joint. It goes towards the diaphysis. Remember, it goes towards the diaphysis. So, multiple lesions like this, also called as diaphysial achalasia, because it grows towards the diaphysis. This is exostosis, which is osteochondroma okay this is exostosis which is osteochondroma okay we need to do mri to look for the cartilage cap because cartilage will be seen only on mri soft tissue the cartilage cap thickness helps us to identify the malignant transformation okay going to the next question so there was some history there a patient with ear discharge what was the complete history i do not remember that a patient with ear discharge and you were given the CT scan image. What is it? Is it a cerebellar abscess, temporal lobe abscess? Is it extradural abscess or this is meningitis? Yes. So now based on the location, you can see that this is the temporal lobe okay the lower most cerebral lobe the cerebrum ka lobe that we see lower most is the temporal lobe here and you have the basi frontal here this is the cerebellum is what we see here there is this ring enhancing lesion the peripheral enhancing the ring enhancing lesion abscess has a ring enhancement it has a peripheral enhancement because in the center it has dead necrotic pus so that does not enhance the surrounding granulation tissue surrounding the absence uh, abscess wall is what enhances so ring enhancing lesion within the brain parenchyma in the temporal lobe this is temporal lobe abscess look at this one now if you would have got an image like this like you see here there is a lesion here in the cerebellum so this is cerebellar abscess Okay, this is what we see here is cerebellar abscess. What we see here in the temporal lobe, these are the dilated prominent temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. Basically, this cerebellar abscess compressing the fourth ventricle and that is what is leading to obstructive hydrocephalus. So, that is the obstructive hydrocephalus changes. This is cerebellar abscess. And what do you think are we seeing here? Okay, thank you Harshandra for these. Now this one, in this image, if you look at this image very carefully, now this is outside the brain parenchyma. Okay, it is compressing the brain parenchyma inside. Again, this is ring enhancing lesion. This is how an extradural abscess will look like. Absolutely right, Swaroop. So, this is an extradural abscess. It is causing the buckling, you can see, of the cortex, a sign of extradural lesions, right? So, this is extradural. 
while your intraaxial lesions like this temporal lobe it is surrounded by the brain parenchyma throughout so that tells you that this is within the brain parenchyma because it is surrounded by brain parenchyma throughout so this is not extra dural the ring enhancement tells you that this is an abscess this is not meningitis right so this is your temporal lobe abscess next one there was a question that there's a patient infertility patient usd is suggestive of uterine anomaly which is the best investigation to confirm the diagnosis is it transvaginal sonography is it hysteroscopy plus laparoscopy is it hsg and what was the fourth option what was the fourth option that we had here anyone right so in the uterine anomalies okay in the uterine anomalies we when we do hst how is hst done so you had an image on hst also right you had an image on hst so you were given the x ray image in the background or you were seeing the white uterus with the fallopian tube it was basically a unicornuate uterus and you had options like is it hysterosalpingogram is it genitogram is it your ct hsd or this is saline infusion wala sonosalpingography now many of you got confused between hsd and saline understand the concept that saline is like water it's fluid it is water it will not look white on x ray or ct scan the purpose of doing hsd is to make the uterine cavity the fallopian tubes look white so that you can see them well that is why it is not saline the saline infusion wala hysterosalpingography is done in ultrasound what do we do is we cannulate the cervix we push the saline and you will see the saline the black fluid for fluid ultrasound is best you will see the black fluid in the in distending the endometrial cavity fallopian tubes and you will see the fluid coming out of the tube into the peritoneum so the answer there was hysterosalpingogram it was straight forward hysterosalpingogram and this is the direct repeat question from your neat pg the last year exam okay so now the best to confirm here is okay the fourth option was laparoscopy only now very important to understand mullerian anomalies is you need to look at the endometrial cavity and you need to look at the outer surface also because the uterine anomalies which are most difficult to differentiate on hsd is septate uterus and bicornuate uterus what is the difference between the two in bicornuate uterus it's a problem in the fusion so you have the two cornu which are separated in the septate uterus the fusion has occurred but you have the septum in between the two cornu okay you have the septum now what happens when we do hsd we only look at the inner cavity the endometrium we are not looking at the outer surface in bicornuate uterus what happens is if this is the endometrium the outer surface also is separated because the fusion has not occurred while in the septate uterus the fusion has occurred the outer surface will be smooth and the inner one the endometrium will be separate because there is basically a septum dividing the two that is why to confirm a uterine anomaly it is important to look at the outer surface also and the inner surface also so for the inner one it is hysteroscopy from below and laparoscopy upar se so inner plus outer that is why the best answer is hysteroscopy and laparoscopy all right next one a boy while working on hammer and chisel had a foreign body entering the eye which of the following investigations is detrimental which of the following should you not do now this was again a very very conceptual question even if you have not read this this is conceptual that hammer and chisel is basically your metallic foreign body 
and we know that in MRI anything metallic is contraindicated because it is based on the magnetic field. It's a very very powerful magnet. So it can cause the displacement, the dislodgement of the foreign body. We do not allow anything metallic in MRI. Everything needs to be MRI compatible. And that is why the answer is MRI. Okay, the answer is MRI. X-ray and CT scan cannot be the answers because both are based on the same principle that is using the X-rays. So, if X-ray is wrong, then CT is wrong. But you can have only one option which is wrong. That is why X-ray is right and CT scan is right. Okay, the answer is MRI because this is a metallic foreign body okay this is a metallic foreign body that is why okay next one you had some 50 year old male with backache and morning stiffness red eye ankle swelling and all of those were given what is the diagnosis anyone remembers the options here one was ankylosing spondylitis one was healed tb spine i think uh, one was pages and the other one was osteopetrosis, if I'm not wrong. Were these the other options that we have? Right, so this was very, very important clue here. Okay, this was very, very important clue here. Ki backache hai. Morning stiffness tells you that this is inflammatory type of arthropathy. Okay. And red eye, we know that in ankylosing spondylitis, uveitis is there. There was straightforward, you could see the bamboo spine appearance, the fusion of the vertebra. Dagger sign was also seen in that. And in this radiograph, you also see the fusion of the sacroiliac joints. It starts with SI joint, sacroilitis. All of these features were seen. There were dagger, there was bamboo spine, there was sacroilitis, the joint fusion. So the answer is ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, the answer is ankylosing spondylitis. It is not TB. It is ankylosing spondylitis because dagger sign was given and the fused vertebra was also given. Okay. Next one, there was one this question. He, there is a patient of spinal TB. The patient has uh, some swelling in the left groin and the patient's limb position is in flexion and medial rotation. Which of the following structures is responsible, right? You had some arrows pointing here. One, two, and you had some other arrows pointing to the muscles. So this basically, when you see flexion mein hai, groin swelling hai, they are talking about psoas abscess. In a patient of TB spine, always think of psoas abscess. So... Uh, where is the psoas located? Paravertebral location. This is the psoas muscle, right? This is the psoas muscle. This is the psoas muscle. What we are measuring here, you can see the fluid density lesion there. That is the psoas abscess. So the answer was psoas. Okay, so the, you had options like A, B, C, D. Which of the following is responsible? It is basically the psoas. Okay, that is the psoas muscle which is responsible. Okay. Next question, so you had a mother who gets a daughter with short stature, webbing of neck, uh, shield-like chest. The question was, ultrasound mein kya dikhega? Will it be hepatomegaly, single kidney, tricuspid stenosis or streak ovaries? So short stature, I think there was some process also which was given, right? And was there a history of amenorrhea in the question? I don't, uh, I don't remember. Was there a uh, history of amenorrhea? This basically points to Turner syndrome. Okay, this basically points to Turner syndrome. And Turner's may, we know that primary amenorrhea, it is basically because of the streak gonads, right? So that is why the answer is streak ovaries with small uterus. You had two questions on Turner's today, right? One question also mentioned the ankle edema. Why? Because in a patient of Turner's, you will see that edema lymphatic obstruction is there. It can cause cystic hygroma, the swelling on the dorsum of hands, dorsum of feet, lymphatic obstruction is there. Infertility, short stature and webbed neck. Okay. So remember the answer is pre-coveries with small uterus. All right. 
Next one. I think there was one question which was a 60 year old female, obese female, presents with abdominal pain, distension, there are increased bowel sounds and it was also given that there is air, there are multiple air fluid levels and there is air in the biliary tree. Okay, a very very important clue given, air in biliary tree. Also, it was given that she had undergone hysterectomy two years back, not in the recent time. Two years back, she had undergone hysterectomy. What do you think is the diagnosis? So, that all pointed to gallstone ileus. You basically have your Riglers triad, right? There is Riglers triad in gallstone ileus. There is ectopic gallstone. There is your small bowel obstruction. And there is air in the biliary tree. That is pneumobilia is seen. So, pneumobilia was an important history. After that, uh -huh. One option was adhesion, small, adha uh, small bowel obstruction due to adhesions. But remember that small bowel obstruction by itself leading to pneumobilia is unlikely. When it is ischemic, voila, when you have mesenteric ischemia, then ischemic enterocolitis, then, they, then you can get your pneumobilia because of the air penetrating through the portal venules. Okay, mesenteric venules se portal mein jane wala. Now, also the history of hysterectomy operation was two years back. In the recent, like post-operative period, the patient can develop ischemia, hypotension, intraoperative, and that can lead to your mesenteric ischemia, like something called as non-obstructive mesenteric ischemia, nomi vagera. Wo case mein, jab aapka jaise necrotizing enterocolitis hota hai, ischemia wala, that can can have pneumobilia but here since hysterectomy was two years back it is not recent post-operative adhesion wala intestinal obstruction by itself will not lead to pneumobilia so it is basically gallstone ileus okay so it is gallstone ileus all right okay and i think there was this one more question which was a patient, a 45-year-old male with hypertension, presenting with acute severe chest pain and there is diaphoresis which is there. But also there was history of loss of consciousness. There were unequal pulses which was given. All of this tells you. And the question was the emergency, mein, which is the best one to make a diagnosis? Options were cardiac enzymes. Okay, options were cardiac enzymes. I think it was also given STT changes are seen in ECG. So, cardiac enzymes, is it your X-ray? Is it MRI thorax? Or is it transesophageal echocardiography? Okay, so in that case, uh, this is aortic dissection. Unequal pulses, loss of consciousness. Basically, your aortic dissection may be involving one subclavian artery. That is why the blood pressure is less there. Or, you know, involving the brain car vessels. That is why there is loss of consciousness. So, all of this tells you aortic dissection. And hypertension is a very important risk factor. In emergency, it is transesophageal echocardiography if the patient is unstable. Thankfully, you did not have other options like CT angiography. When the patient is stable, we can do CT angiography also, but that was not there. MRI is most accurate for aortic dissection, but in chronic cases. In emergencies, MRI takes a lot of time, so we do not prefer doing MRI. CT is preferred and bedside uh, echocardiography can be done. So that is your transesophageal echocardiography. Okay. So those were the questions in radiology. There was one more question which I remember. I had mentioned in 5 p.m. class also. A female presenting with abdominal pain, distension, uh, organ failure in the last 24 hours. CT scan shows pancreas which is bulky and there is fluid density lesion in the pancreas. So bulky organ, any organ which is increased in size. Always think of acute inflammation because of the edema, fluid, it becomes enlarged in size. So this is acute inflammation of pancreas. So, this is acute pancreatitis. You have your fluid collections, the AFCs that you see. And the question was, which of the following will be increased? Is it AST? Is it lipase? 
is it creatine kinase or is it blood urea nitrogen so if you read this properly radiology integrated bulky pancreas fluid density it is acute pancreatitis lipase is a more sensitive enzyme than amylase so the answer is increased lipase okay the answer is increased lipase all right so that was about radiology questions surprisingly there were a lot of questions from radiology and we've been seeing the trend in the recent years that radiology is gaining a lot of importance in your entrance exams be it direct or be it integrated so now yes we need to focus on the black and white of radiology as well okay raghavendra what was the question the kidney site of injury so maybe uh, there might be a few more questions which I have not received yet and I might have missed. If I get more questions, I'll keep you posted on the Telegram group as well. Dr. Nikita's Rad Synapse. What was the exact question on the kidney trauma? So see, specifically if the question in kidney trauma was uh, about... Uh, if the question of uh, kidney trauma was about the site of injury to see for site of injury, it is CT scan that we do. Yes, absolutely. So if there was hematuria and the question was how will you localize the site of hematuria, then CT scan is what you should be doing, especially if the patient is stable. We need to know whether the patient is stable or not stable. Okay. Okay. Yes, there was one more question on that. Empyma thoracis, liver abscess, gastric volvulus, or it is hollow viscous uh, perforation. Remember, that was your hollow viscous perforation. So you were given two x-rays. I forgot to put that. It is erect and supine x-rays that you were given. So, you could see that, you know, where you might have got confused. Here image, mein, there was beneath the diaphragm, there was black air and there was basically this air fluid level so along with pneumoperitoneum the patient also had ascites that was pneumoperitoneum so it was hollow viscous organ it was not gastric volvulus because you could very well see the ng tube into the stomach we know that in gastric volvulus right in your gastric volvulus your borchard striate you won't be able to put the ng tube so gastric volvulus is out liver abscess you will not be able to see on x-ray. Aapko x-ray mein liver abscess nahi dikhega. That is out. Empyma thoracis should be above the diaphragm. Okay, you should see some loculated, D-shaped, something like that above the diaphragm. This was black air beneath the diaphragm. In the supine, you could see the uh, gas collection on one side. Supine mein the gas comes up. So that was perforation. Okay, that was perforation. Okay. So... That is uh, all about the radiology questions, guys. If I get more, if you remember more, do let me know on Telegram group. I'll get back to you with the answers. And thank you so much, uh, Nikhil, for those kind words. So we at an academy, all the educators, we work really hard to help you in your journey. And if that helps you, our mission is achieved. You know, all our uh, efforts are worthwhile. So thank you so much. And remember that this is not the end if the exam was not well. In the coming days, if you realize there are some questions which went wrong. Remember, not all the questions will be right. Jo aapko right lag rahe the, wo bhi shayad right nahi ho. There will be many questions like that. And it's normal. It's for everyone. It will be for everyone. You are not the only one. Remember that. So take a break, relax, you deserve a break, you know, you have your well-deserved break now, relaxation time and I'll see you on the other side very, very soon. I'll be waiting very eagerly to hear each one of your success story. Wishing you all the very best for the results and keep studying, you know, the studies are never going to end. Keep revising and keep winning. Thank you so much.